Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Wassalatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulillah, Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Man Wala. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh. To all our brothers and sisters around the world, Assalamu Alaikum to you all. Welcome to part 12 of the Seerah, the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Last week, in the last 10 minutes, uh, we spoke about the conversion of Hamza radiallahu anhu into Islam. Now I'm sure that the majority of you already know this story. But I'd like to highlight one thing about it. And that is that the way Hamza radiallahu anhu embraced Islam was quite unique. It came out of an emotional reaction. An emotional reaction. The emotional reaction was that he wanted, he got angry for his nephew Muhammad وسلم, when Abu Jahl insulted him, a terrible insult like he had never insulted him before around the Kaaba. So Abu Jahl, uh, Hamza radiallahu went and as you know he hit Abu Jahl and said to him, I am on his religion. And then he walked away, he's a very respected man who was very strong, very courageous. Nobody wanted to mess with Hamza radiallahu anhu. And that night he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm just summarizing, Oh Allah, if my nephew is on the truth, then guide me to his religion. Guide me. And if he is not, then let me die tonight. And the next morning he was still alive, went to his nephew Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took the opportunity to explain Islam to him. He did not waste the time. And Hamza radiallahu anhu embraced Islam on the spot. And the Quraysh people found out and they said, uh, the Muslims have not received yet until this point a greater glory than the conversion of Hamza out of all people. Hamza is one of the chiefs. He's a big man and he's a very respected person as we said. And for him to convert to Islam gave the Muslims that extraordinary power. The Quraysh people who were the enemies, they started to fear fear the Muslims to a certain extent. They would have to be careful before they take their next move. Not only because Hamza radiallahu was strong, I mean the Quraysh people can take him on by himself, but because of the position he held. Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet wasallam, who is the brother of Hamza, he is the chief of... Banu Abdul Muttalib or Banu Hashim. But he's still a non-Muslim. Hamza is another chief. He has a big name among Banu Hashim. For him to say a word can influence and affect the entire tribe, which is considered one of the, is probably the top tribe in Mecca. So that's why Hamza radiallahu anhu's conversion to Islam was the greatest glory to them. What this teaches us brothers and sisters in Islam Anybody embraces Islam and there is no one better than another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there is no preference of an Arab to a non-Arab except in piety and taqwa. And no preference of any male or female or rich or poor or person of big status or low status in Islam. We are all equal like the teeth of, comb, of the comb as Rasulullah taught us. However, it is also out of wisdom to try and teach and reach Islam to the people of significance and influence. Of significance and influence. And here is a trick question. How do you reach them? If we're going to sit back and start to become rigid in the way we propagate Islam and teach Islam, then we're not going to get anywhere. Number one, we cannot hide in a metaphorical cave. We cannot sit back and hide in the mosque. It has to be an open thing. We cannot hide without communicating with our neighbors or show what we are and our deen in our workplace as much as we can. It doesn't have to be with talking. A lot of people think that you have to talk and convince people and influence people. Some people get their ego in between their da'wah and themselves. They think that they want to have power over people to convert them. In our character, in our honesty, in our uh, dealings, is the greatest form of 
showing people our deen, brothers and sisters in Islam. And especially here in Australia, I can tell you being raised in Australia, you guys can probably relate to that, that the, the worst thing you can do to the common Aussie person is just talk and act opposite to your talk. Hypocrisy is the worst thing. It's a form of hypocrisy. I'm not saying that someone who doesn't act what they say is a hypocrite. Obviously, giving da'wah and speaking Islam is bigger than all of us. And I don't want anyone to say, oh, look, anyone who speaks, if they don't practice what they say, then they're not, not allowed to speak. I myself cannot practice everything in perfection in what I speak. But are you, am I going to sit here telling you only what I am good at and only speak about what I'm good at? Then no one will learn about Islam. I, like you, am improving and trying to improve. The arrogant person is the one who pushes other people and deliberately says to themselves, I don't need to practice. They're arrogant people, people of ego. But to say that I have uh, mistakes and I have shortcomings doesn't stop you from speaking about Islam. So for example, if you have a problem with keeping promises all the time, it doesn't stop you from teaching other people about keeping, your promises, keeping promises in Islam. Right? How can we teach our children when we know that we as parents don't practice everything correctly, but we're trying. But doesn't mean you don't teach your children honesty, for example. But you try your best to be a role model. And human beings make mistakes, and we learn through our mistakes. But what I'm trying to say is this. Number one, we shouldn't be ashamed of our deen. And when I say don't be ashamed, it doesn't mean that we go out and don't use wisdom. I'm not ashamed of my deen, and we start shouting and, 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 and yelling and coming out in a way that puts people off. There are many ways that we can give da'wah. Uh, once I went to a hospital, getting into the elevator, and a doctor, who is, I noticed from his tag, he is uh, a director of one of the, one of the uh, um, areas in ICU, and he was a Jewish man with his Jewish beard and the, the locks on the side with the hat and everything. The integrity and honesty of a person that they show is more important than the lip service that we have. And one of the most important things is us, as Muslims, trying our best, even if we disagree, to come to terms on things that we can agree on and put our own opinions aside. When we say that we cannot take part in this thing or that thing, we are limiting ourselves. The Muslims reached China within a few years after the Prophet wasallam, And we're limiting ourselves and closing ourselves off. Going into, anyhow, for example, Jewish people have two senators in parliament. Why are they able to pass laws for themselves? Did you know that the other day I heard, which is true from a rabbi, that by law they actually have their own right to pass judgment for people who are married, in marriage and divorce, and the court recognizes it. We Muslims don't have that. Why? Because although they don't agree with each other, and a lot of them compete, when it comes to their overall benefit, the community's benefit, they all have one word, one say. What do we do? <coughs> anyway, my brothers and sisters, we cannot agree to squatting a fly. So we need to improve on that, inshallah, inshallah, next generation to break those barriers of my opinion and your opinion and try to focus on breathing. We are now drowning. We need to breathe. So we're drowning and we're still talking about whether we can... Uh, we're still talking about, for example, uh, what kind of yacht we want to take or what kind of boat we want to take and you're drowning what you've been thinking about is let's breathe first before we start arguing about who's going to have what my brothers and sisters in Islam the Muslims were united with one word and Hamza radiallahu anhu was an influence and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi did not shun any of them away you will see today inshallah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam praised and acknowledged and communicated extensively with non-Muslims among the enemies. And those who were non-Muslims who had good character, the Prophet ﷺ highlighted it immensely. He did not shy away and say, for example, these are kuffar, I'm, only, I'm not going to say anything good about them. Yes, we acknowledge them. 
And there's nothing wrong with interacting with them. And even liking them. We don't like the disbelief that's in them. But we don't hate them as people. Unless they are enemies of you and fighting you. And that's just natural for anybody. If a Muslim fights you, you're going to start hating them inside of you. I don't need to say that's already happening in families, isn't it? By default. So we need to rise above that, inshaAllah ta'ala. If you can't change everyone, start by changing yourself as much as you can. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, Hamza radiallahu anhu became the strength, one of the strengths of Muslims. Uh, next, the Quraysh became very disturbed about this. And they backed off for a little while. And they thought, let's try and come up with some better strategy. So they approached the Prophet wasallam one day with some questions and challenges. They said to him, if you are speaking the truth, then why don't you bring down from the heavens before our eyes a garden, a grapevine, a garden full of grapes. This is, this is in the Qur'an. And then they hit him with another question. So they didn't wait for the answer, by the way. They put, first challenge, bring down a, a garden of grapes. Another man stood up and said, why don't, you, <coughs> why don't you bring down a book before our eyes that we can see in the hands of angels that we can read for ourselves rather than you telling us what you have heard. Bring down a book before our eyes so we can see in the hands of angels. Another one stood up and said, why don't you bring us the angels themselves that you claim that you've been speaking to? Let them come before our eyes and show us some miracles. And another one stood up. They're not waiting for the answer. Another one stood up. And why don't you bring down rivers so that, and f- fountains that we can use. Yeah, look, Mecca is scarce with water. Why don't you bring out water and, and let it burst from gushing from the earth? And then another one came up and said, why don't you bring Allah and the angels together so we can see them before our eyes? How are we supposed to believe in you when you don't have these miracles? Believe in a God that we can't see. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ reacted by not replying to a single challenge or question they said. And the question is why? This is in Surah uh, An-Nahl in the Qur'an where they made these challenges. Why didn't he bring them all these things? He could have asked Allah for all these things. He actually did. They themselves are worshipping idols which they carved with their hands. They believe that they are gods. And yet before their eyes, they never gave them any grape uh, vines or fountains of water or angels coming from the heavens or books descending upon them from above or bring God down. They They don't even speak to you and you see them before your eyes. These people are challenging you with something when they have accepted something that is quite ridiculous. Like when someone says, I don't believe in Islam, I don't believe in religion, but they take star signs, for example, and they read their horoscope. They believe in stuff like that. They believe in superstitions. Some of them, they do that. So they believe in less. That's number one. Number two, the questions that they are posing are not questions to know the answer to. These are questions in order just to create doubt with other people. When a person wants to create doubt in your mind, they don't ask you questions to know. They throw question after question at you just to take you off balance. It's what the late Allah Muhammad Ali used to do with his opponents opponents in the boxing ring. He'd throw these words, not wanting an answer, but just to destroy their self-esteem. And he'd defeat them. Of course, it's a trick. And Rasulullah said, How do you know a hypocrite? One of his signs or her signs is that إِذَا خَاصَمَ فَجَرْ when they come to debate you, if you oppose them in anything and you corner them, what do they do? This is the sign of a hypocrite. They explode in argumentation. Either they raise their voice and shout. They throw questions after questions. They character assassinate you. For example, look who's speaking. You've done this and you've done that. It's beside the point. Or they swear and they yell or they act like a victim. And you have no room to even talk. They gather people, they cry and they walk off. What have they done? Caused the scene, made chaos, 
and silence the other person, this is not how an educational debate happens or a challenge. And the questions that they're asking is basically just trying to manipulate. And that's what a person does. When they don't want the truth, what do they do? If you tell them one thing, they bring up something else. Tell them another thing, they'll bring up something else. Tell them a the third thing, they'll bring up something else. And it's never ending. It is never ending. It's never ending. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. If the Prophet ﷺ answered them, he already answered them in the Qur'an itself. They had just seen before their eyes something which is a challenge to them already. And that is, these few words that I'm telling you, if you do not believe they are from Allah, then bring like them. Allah said, Say, if all of the jinns and the ints, the human beings and the jinns, were to gather together to bring a book, a Qur'an like this one, لا يأتون بمثله they cannot bring one like it. Even if they reached out to the outskirts of the world for all them to help them and bring their supporters, they will not be able to bring one like it. Then it poses the question, then bring one like it if you do not believe. They could not do that. Then Allah posed another challenge, which is less. says, فَأْتُوا Bring ten chapters like it. They couldn't do that. We're talking to the Arabs of the language. Then he said, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ Bring one chapter like it, and the shortest one is, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرِ فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَانْحَرْ إِنَّ شَانِئَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَرِ One line and a half. They couldn't even do that. A simple challenge they couldn't meet, and now they're asking to see God and all that stuff. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did reply. And he said to the, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, قُلْ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّي Say, my Lord is the most perfect. هَلْ كُنْتُ إِلَّا بَشَرَ الرَّسُولَ I am nothing but a human like you, except the only difference is I am a messenger. That's my job. Whoever wants to believe, believes. Whoever doesn't want to, doesn't have to. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did answer more. He said, We brought the signs and the verses as the people of the prophets before asked for. They asked for a she-camel that came out of a rock, we gave it to them. Some of them asked for miracles of healing the leper and raising the dead, we gave them to them. They saw angels walk before their eyes. They saw the ocean split before their eyes. They saw and they saw and they saw. And then Allah said, And behold, if the people ask for a miracle beyond this and God gives it to them, there is a condition. Allah says, this is my law on earth. If you ask a supernatural miracle to show it beyond what I have already so shown you, then there is a condition, there is a consequence. If you don't believe afterwards, then the right of punishing you and destroying you, you have to accept it. And that's what happened to all the people before. When the signs came to them and they rejected them, Allah destroyed them. He said, okay, come back. There's no reason or purpose for you to continue living anymore. The, because I've shown you the biggest miracles. If you don't believe in them, then there's nothing you can believe in. And Allah did say, and even if we brought them what they are asking for, they will still not believe. Because we gave them even lesser. We gave them even bigger than that. And that is a book which they are reading before their eyes, which challenges them. Everything you see around you is a reason to believe in a creator. The fact that you exist is the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we take for granted the miracles before our eyes? The oxygen that we breathe. And Allah says He is able to create the, foot, the fingerprints that are in your thumbs and fingers and not one is alike than the other. Should we not, Allah says, look at that as a miracle? Or do you take Allah's miracles for granted? How many miracles do you belie? And they're right before your eyes. But because we see them all the time, we forget that they are miracles. My brothers and sisters, Jibreel alayhi salam said to him, Ya Rasulullah, we can give them what you are asking. But if we give them and they do not believe, then they are going to be destroyed. This is the only condition. And then the Prophet ﷺ became afraid. He said, I don't want that to happen because some of them will disbelieve. And he said, no. Allahumma hadi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide my people for they just do not know. <coughs> and there is a miracle actually. 
The moon split, it's in the Quran. The hour has come near and the moon has split. It's in Sahih Muslim Bukhari that one day they woke up and the moon, the full moon was in half. They saw it come one from the east and the other one was setting in the west. I'm not going to go into that too much and it's not that which we hold on to to prove the miracle and the truth of Islam. Brothers and sisters, it kills me when you see, for example, on YouTube or the internet, people coming up with these ridiculous things. Oh, look, there is the name of Allah in the clouds. See, 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 share, share. And if you don't share, that means you don't believe in Allah. And people in the millions, a cloud that looks like a squiggly, I mean, Arabic is squiggly lines. You can basically make out of anything the name of Allah or anything you like. A Christian can come along and say, I can see a cross above it. So therefore, Christ is the truth. This is not what we hold on to. Oh, we found in a tamara the name of Muhammad. Miracle, my brothers and sisters. Allahu Akbar. You see, this is our weakness. This is our failure. When we settle with people laughing at us, bringing us these... It's like a person drowning and trying to hold onto a straw. Straw to breathe, to get out of the water. It's when it's a drop. I don't need that. Alhamdulillah, we have ample... Just learn it. Knowledge and insha'Allah ta'ala Allah will give us the hidayah. Alhamdulillah. We don't need to believe in these little things. Oh look, so and so we saw them come out of their grave and like we changed someone was changed from one grave to another. He was meant to be a righteous person. His problem has been dead for ten years and his form is still the same. You see the stuff on YouTube. Allahu alam still is a man that just buried them then then and there and they're making up a story about him. There's all these different stories that subhanAllah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we do not follow stuff like that to prove the truth. The truth is the truth by using things which are evidence, common sense, logic, the Qur'an, the Sunnah. You don't need to go to all these ridiculous things. One person said to me, we're doing a barbecue and all of us witnessed that when we came to spill the uh, ashes down near the wall, the ashes went up and before our eyes we saw like the name of Allah being written. This is a sign from Allah. This is not the signs Allah talked about, my brothers and sisters. He says, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتُنَا فِي الْآفَاتِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ وَمِمَّا لَا يَعْلَمُونَ We shall show them in the future more of our signs in the horizons, in space, and in themselves and things which they did not know. These are not things like this. A fish with the name of Allah written on it makes headlines. We don't go by that. The signs Allah shows is more of what He has created. We have discovered the atom and the neutrons and electrons and protons and how they rotate in an anti-clockwise motion. We've discovered the Milky Way and the solar system and the galaxies and the might and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا يَشْحَدُ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Nobody denies these signs of Allah's existence and His creation except the ones who are arrogant and full of disbelief. My brothers and sisters in Islam, so they brought these signs and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is ridiculous. This is not a game where you can just sit there and throw anything. So that was dealt with. And instead, the Quran kept going and people were embracing Islam without all of this stuff. My brothers and sisters in Islam, maybe one day we'll do a talk, a lecture just on why we can't see Allah and His angels. There is an, a huge reasoning with that, but I would need... A whole hour or two hours to explain to insha'Allah ta'ala. Or maybe even less. So let's move on. So this one they failed with. And uh, the Qur'an referred to Ad and Thamud, their ancestors, Arabs that were extinct. They could see their remnants. Allah said in the Qur'an, Look at your ancestors Ad and Thamud. We gave them signs and it's written in your scriptures. But you can see their remnants, their homes are still there. Uh, Ad are the people who are just outside of... Uh, Mecca, a bit of a distance away and that's where you see they carved palaces inside of mountains that's over there in Ad and Thamud are the ones who have their palaces in Jordan they're carved in mountains it's called Petra if you look it up on the internet on Google image you can see it Allah tells us why? you can see the remnants of those people still there yet they are extinct and we told them and we brought them the signs. Can you see any existence of them yet? Yet we left their signs as a warning and as a truth and so on and so forth. So Allah said, Allah doesn't want to do the same thing to you. So fear Allah and return. Now Abu Jahl started to become angrier and angrier. So one day a group of them, they wanted to just tease the Prophet. See when you can't beat someone, 
you become a bully. And what do you do? You start mocking them and teasing them and calling them names. So one day the Prophet ﷺ was prostrating, sujood, when there was Abu Jahl and Uqba ibn Abu Mu'ayyid and Ubay ibn Khalaf and few other people, they were sitting there and there was a large uh, chunk of, a large, um, uh, large intestines of a camel with, with feces and urine in it and <coughs> all that stuff. So somebody had slaughtered the camel and there was all these remains. It's huge. A camel's, in t- camel's intestine is huge. It's very heavy. More than 50 kilos. And uh, one of them said to the other, we don't know, said, Hey, who has the courage to go and grab those intestines and when Muhammad is prostrating, throw it on top of his head, on his back and head? Uqba ibn Abu Mu'ayyid is the one that volunteered. He said, I'll do it. You see, what happened with him was that they had bullied him as well. Remember the story when they said, go and spit in the Prophet's face and prove to us that you are on our side? And now his ego is sort of, you know, once you do something wrong, then you say to yourself, well, I'm an evil person, so I might as well be evil. I'll make that my identity. I'll die upon that. At least I die with some purpose. And he became worse and worse. When you follow a people who tell you to do the wrong thing, it starts becoming a habit for you and you enjoy the praise. But really it's false praise. So Uqba gets up, carries these intestines with his hands and everything and goes and drops them on the Prophet's blessed head. The blood, the pus, the intestines, the feces all landed on the Prophet ﷺ and the smell covered his whole face. And the Prophet ﷺ, from its heaviness he couldn't, he couldn't lift his head up. So instead he stayed in his position and kept remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The stench and the smell. Who saw him? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a slave. And he said, I couldn't do anything. And that's true. Any slave there, you can't do anything. He said, I didn't have the power to help the Prophet Otherwise, they would have killed me. So Fatima, his daughter, radiallahu anha, Zahra, saw him. She ran and saying the word that Abu Bakr used to say, أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ I'm going to kill a man just because he says, my Lord is Allah. She's, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, I looked at them. There was about five or six of them. And they were laughing their heads off. He goes, they were laughing so badly that they sat on the floor with their legs going upwards. And they couldn't hold themselves sitting with their bellies vibrating from the laughter. And they were leaning on each other because they couldn't sit. That's how much they laughed at the Prophet Subhanallah. And Fatima tried to take it off and clean it off the Prophet head. When the Prophet got up, he turned to them and lifted his hands up to Allah. At that point, all of them, including Abu Jahl and Uqban, all of them, they all went quiet. And the Prophet ﷺ made a specific dua against each one of them by name. How did he say, Oh Allah, deal with so-and-so, deal with so-and-so, deal with so-and-so. Dua. Now, they've got no problem. If they don't believe in God and His message, then they've got nothing to fear. Isn't that right? It's like when we say, for example, look, the Quran talks about those who believe will enter paradise, those who choose to disbelieve knowingly, will enter hellfire. And those who never know, then Allah will deal with them in a special way on the Day of Judgment. We don't know. And some people get upset and we say to them, listen, it's not you who we hate and it's not you who we are demeaning. It's disbelief that we are demeaning, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. I'm just telling the truth. If I don't believe in something, why should I get upset? Now, this person, they, they're not supposed to be afraid. And they went quiet and they got afraid of the Prophet ﷺ's dua because deep inside we said, they actually know that he's on the truth. But it was the arrogance that stops them. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, in the battle of Badr, I saw every single one of them who was there had been killed. And they were thrown in a well. My brothers and sisters in Islam, why isn't Allah sending angels to protect the Prophet ﷺ, for example? Why is this happening to him? Well, we said... Because Rasulullah has been sent as a role model for us. And he has to go through all these trials in order to show us how we should be. There's come to you a perfect example in the Prophet Muhammad. So he went through it all, my brothers and sisters, in order to teach us. My brothers and sisters in Islam, he was weak at that time. He did not swear at them, he did not do the same as them. We don't reply and react the same way they do if they, if they do that. And Allah says, And when the ignorant ones, 
the people who are thugs and louts and have no education, or the people who are full of arrogance, they talk to them. Qalu salam. The Muslims used to say, peace, peace. La nabtaghil jahilin. We don't want the ignorant ones. Or you might say, I'm not an ignorant person. Or you just walk away. There's no need. Rasulullah said, لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو Do not wish to meet the enemy. But if the enemy presents himself before you and there's no way to go, he said, stand like a lion. Be brave and don't walk away. But don't wish to meet the enemy. Go, to go, don't get out of your way. This is not what we have been sent to do. My brothers and sisters in Islam, that was the incident of that. <coughs> At that point... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make it up to the Prophet and he wanted to give him some good news and make him feel a little bit better about himself. So, one day, the Umar radiallahu anhu started to hear about Muslims migrating to Abyssinia, the first migration. And he was confused. Why are they going now? This is, this is tremendous. This is horrendous. And he started getting angrier and angrier. So he said, you know what? The only decision is to kill this man. He had a good intention, but wrong act. And the ends don't justify the means. Good intention, wrong act. He's thinking unite the people by killing the messenger of God. That's not the way. So one day he said, I wanted to go and drink alcohol with some friends of mine. So we went to the local pub in nowadays, if you like. Loved alcohol, Umar ibn Khattab. So did Hamza. He said, as we were going there, there was no alcohol left or wine, or so I think it was closed. So he said, to get my mind off it, because he was addicted to it, he said, I decided to go to the Haram, to the Kaaba. Maybe and do some tawab and get my mind off it. He goes, as I approached, I saw Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah, praying. And I thought to myself, this is my opportunity. It was deep in the night. He had his sword with him, and he goes, I'll approach him and kill him once and for all and run away. Nobody will know who killed him. By myself. There was no one around. He said, I crept up to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while he was oblivious. He didn't know that I was behind him. As I approached, I started to hear what he was reading. And what he was reading was the following. He said, I heard the Prophet wasallam recite in Surah al haqqa He goes, I've never given my opportunity to hear him right, but that day, I couldn't help but listen. And he said, I heard the Prophet wasallam recite these beautiful words from the beginning. So I stopped and I started to listen. You know, deep in the night, no one around. And that's actually a good idea to talk to people when they're alone. I say to some students at school, when they say, this person bullies me, this person hurts me, I say, listen, one good idea is Take an opportunity when they're alone, approach them and say, Salaamu Alaikum and say, Hey, can we just can I talk to you? you say, Yeah, yeah, man. There's no friends around, no one to impress. Because everyone look in their nature, they they like peace. Everyone in their nature, even your enemy, even the person who hates you, they like peace. They don't want trouble. But it's the ego and when people are watching and their reputation, they don't want to talk. So one way is to approach this person by themselves in peace and say, Salaamu alaykum, can we talk? Hey look, man, have I done anything to you know harm you? No. Look, we can fight, I can swear it the same way. But I decided to come and talk and come to an agreement. You respect me and I respect you, man. And just, you know, don't be afraid. So look, I'm not afraid. But this has gone on, you know. Either we can get suspended, both of us, or we can get into a fight or something. Or we can talk about it and say, let's respect each other. And there's nothing between us. Talk about it. And a person listens to you when there's no reason for them to grow their ego. Someone's angry, don't talk to them when they're angry. You see people around moving them on. Don't talk to them. Wait for another time. So he heard. He's, and as he was listening, Omar said, these were the first time that the Qur'an entered into my ear properly. And I thought to myself, wow, this man has 
is extremely crafty or he has talent in the way he formulates his words. And then as the Prophet is reciting, he reached the part where it says, and, and then he said, uh, sorry, before that he said, he crafts his word. There could be words of some great poet that we don't know about. And then he recited, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ It is not the words of a poet. Do you not believe? The Prophet is reciting. He doesn't know Umar is behind him. And Allah is having a conversation with Umar. Not directly. Umar is thinking that. And Allah is letting him hear that. And that was the thing with Umar. Him in the Quran. He'd say something after he embraced Islam. Allah would send a verse exactly as he said. The Prophet used to say, Ya Umar, what's wrong? You, know, you say something, Allah sends down something in your, in your favor. So he's thinking, maybe he's got these words from poetry. And then he reaches, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرِ No, it is not the words of poets. He goes, wow. He, it hit him hard. He said, okay, well, maybe it's some soothsayer, you know, fortune teller, soothsayer's words. In the next verse, what is it? وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَانِمٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ No, it's not the words of a soothsayer. Don't you remember? Yeah. Omar is freaking out here. So then he said, well, maybe he's just making him up from his head. And then Allah said, what well, verse after that? وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَوِي لَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُ بِالْيَمِينَ ثُمَّ لَقَطَعْنَا مِنْهُ الْوَتِينَ فَمَا مِنْكُمْ أَخَذْنَا عَنْهُ حَاجِزِينَ No. And if he were to make up any words from his own head, we will take his jugular vein and rip out his aorta. And no one will be able to protect him if he lied. Umar al-Khattab said, I was stunned and shocked. Okay, so I just sat down and kept listening. Until the Prophet finished. And I just walked away. I thought, what, what has just happened to me? And he said, that was the first time the Qur'an actually entered my heart. The next day, Abu Jahl and the rest were meeting in Dar al-Arqam. Sorry, not Dar al-Arqam. Dar al-Nadwa, the council place. And they were saying... Anyone who kills, that brings the Prophet you know, dead, will have a hundred camels. And so Omar became greedy. Money. So he said, I'm going to go and kill him. He forgot all about the Qur'an. The story is long. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it and have seen the action movie about, not the action movie, the, uh, the film, the series, Omar series. A lot of you have read about how he became embraced Islam. So the common story, and I'll just summarize it. He went to kill the Prophet ﷺ. He took his uh, sword, opened, he said, I'll kill him and even if his people kill me back, I'll take it. And if not, then I'll win those camels. So he went on his way and there was a Muslim by the name of Nu'aym. He had embraced Islam in secret. And he said, what's wrong with you, Ya Umar? And mutawashihun saifak, you've got your sword unsheathed. That meant trouble. And Umar, when he said something, he has to do it. He was like Hamza. He won't go back on his word. And he said, I'm going to go and kill that man who's divided the people up and so on and so forth. And then Nu'aym thought, what am I going to do? He said, well, if you're going to do that, then why don't you start with your own family and don't be a hypocrite about it? He said, what do you mean? He said, your own sister Fatima and her husband <coughs> have embraced Islam. He goes, I was sabaw. They've deserted this din? He said, yeah. He goes, damn this. I'm going to have to go and look after him. How am I going to go and kill Muhammad when my own family has embraced it? What are they going to say about Umar? You know when we, that saying? Look after your own backyard. So he went down to Fatima's house. As he knocked the door very heavily, he heard some words like the Quran. And he listened before he knocked. He remembered the recitation of the Prophet ﷺ, al haqqa and he liked those words. But he was just too angry. Banged the door really harshly. His Fatima looked. His sister. She saw her brother. And who was there reading the Quran to them? Khabbab ibn al-Arat. Remember when we talked about him, Allah, the one who was tortured the most? He was a slave and he was tortured the most. Man, the last person was him to sort of face Umar. The poor guy. Always cops it. And that's what happened with the Prophet ﷺ. When someone embraces Islam, the first thing he did was he put a teacher with them. To teach them the Qur'an and the Salat and all that stuff. What do we do, and I have to say it, when someone converts to Islam? What do we do? We chuck a celebration of takbir. And he looks in front of him and sees a sea of beards, mashallah, a sea of hijabs. Allahu Akbar and thinks, my God, I'm gliding above the moon. Flying in the air. <laughs> Next day, where did they all go? <laughs> Eid comes. 
These poor people who converted to Islam. They got no family, they got no Eid. Where do they go? Ramadan comes, who are they making iftar with? No one. No one asks about them, unfortunately. I hate to talk about these negativities, but this is reality, brothers and sisters. And we should be aware of that. That these people are a responsibility upon our necks. Man, even zakat is allowed to people who embrace this Islam or close because it considers that they're going to have a rough time with their family. They may be disowned, they may be shunned. Which means that they may have financial difficulties. So zakat is allowed to them, to help them and support them. Subhanallah. Rasulullah talked about the end of time where he said the Muslims are so many, but they are like the foam of the sea, bubbles. They have no power to do anything. And Ahrul Rum, meaning the West, will be in power. They said, well, how is this? And then the narrator of the hadith says it's because of four habits which they have. And one of those habits is Asra'uhum li miskinu muda'if. They are the quickest to feed the poor and look after the hungry. This is our trait it means meant to be. And Allah gives these people victory today because of these traits. So anyway, he sent Khabbab. Umar ibn Khattab enters. Fatima hides the words of the Quran they were reciting from Surah Taha underneath her. And we know the story where he started... He, she had, he had a fight with her and then he punched her husband and then he punched his sister down. He had never touched his sister. Physical abuse is haram in Islam. He made the blood come out of her nose and mouth and that's when Umar looked at her and said, Oh my God, what have I done? I've never hit my sister before. And he sat down regretting what he had done. So he came to apologize to her and she said, Get away from me. So then he said, Give me what you're reading. She said, You will not be able to touch it because you're impure. Go and have a shower first. She didn't, he didn't have to, she didn't have to tell him to do that, but you know, obviously it's the least she can do. He goes and has a shower and he comes back and her husband's watching thinking, hold on a minute, maybe this is a good sign. He reads from Surah Taha and he starts to enter his, his um, heart. Now he starts praising and said, you know, words like this have to be followed. They cannot be words of man. They have to be words of Allah. And then who's hearing him? Khabbab. He was hiding. So he comes out. He <laughs> says, hey. And he goes, are you the one who was reading before your Khabbab? He says, yes, it's me. His sister and, and her husband are looking up and thinking he's going to clobber him, kill him. And Khabbab said, don't worry. I feel there's good news here. And Umar says, take me to the Messenger of Allah. First time he calls him Rasulullah. So he takes him to Dar al-Arqam. And there he knocks on the door. One of the Sahabas looks through the keyhole or through the crack of the door and he sees Umar <laughs> out of all people, man. Abu Jahl is his uncle. And they go to the Prophet ﷺ and say, Umar. They all get scared. Hamza stands up and says, what are you afraid of? Let him in. If he's come to hurt us or hurt the Prophet ﷺ, where enough people will kill him and bury him alive if we want to. And if he's come for good news, alhamdulillah. He entered, and two big men among the Sahabas dragged him along, because Umar al Khattab was massive, right? They brought him to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, while sitting down, he grabs Umar from his collar and pulls him down aggressively. Why? Umar is a man of wrestling, and the Prophet made him feel how strong he is. And Umar fell down before the Sahabas. The Prophet shook him heavily and said, When are you going to embrace Islam, Ya Umar? Before a qari'ah befalls you, before a catastrophe befalls you from Allah. Now why is he saying that? The Prophet ﷺ has made dua for one of the two Umars. Amr ibn Hisham or Umar ibn Khattab. Amr ibn Hisham is Abu Jahl or Umar. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted one of them to embrace Islam. And that's out of wisdom. He wants someone with power and might that has influence to embrace Islam. And Allah had guided Umar and Prophet Sallallahu thought, I'm going to shake that, whatever's left in him, and take him off guard and shake it. And that's when Umar said, I bear witness there is only one God and you are his messenger. Allah Akbar, the Muslims said, this is the greatest triumph. Abdullah ibn Abbas says, we never felt the glory of Islam until the day when Umar embraced Islam. We've never felt it before like that. What was the first thing Umar did? He said, Ya Rasulullah, let me go out. What do you want to do? He says, I want to tell everybody that I've embraced Islam. 
He was the first one to do that. He goes up to his uncle Abu Jahal and to Walid al Mughira and the rest of them saying, I became a Muslim. And they became so angry and disgusted by it. And it was terrible for them. So then he goes and says, Who is the one that uh, has the biggest mouth in Mecca? And they, there was some guy, and he was always a backbiter. Big backbiter, gossiper. So who does Umar go to? He goes to the gossiper. He says to him, Am I anni aslamt? Didn't you know that I had embraced Islam? He said, No, Ya Umar. He said, Well, I've embraced Islam. He goes, That's good, good on you, man. And just walked away, slithered away, and before you know, within an hour, the whole of Makkah found out that Muhammad had become Muslim. So, this is a good time to use gossipers when you are courageous enough and strong enough to, if you want to propagate something that uh, has benefit, inshallah, use the gossipers. That's all they have to do with Muslims these days, don't they, unfortunately? Sometimes if we don't have wisdom, they throw something. <laughs> they throw something, a bait. And what happens? We start burning embassies and burning <laughs> churches and things. Astaghfirullah. No, I'm not talking about the majority of Muslims. We're talking about that minority, which may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all, inshallah ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, Umar ibn Khattab comes out, and uh, the Quraysh people gather against him, and they start to fight him. In the narration it says he started fighting them from, sun, from when he went out, approximately Dhuhr, until sunset. They hit him and hit, hit them and finally he saw one of their chiefs and he grabbed them, put his two fingers in his eyes and said, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to poke his eyes out. Everybody backed off. And then one of his clan, <coughs> one of Umar's clan, he said, what the hell are you doing, you people? Don't you know he belongs to our tribe? If you harm him, then there will be a tribal war between us. Leave him alone. And so they left him alone. Umar ibn Khattab returned and he said, Ya Rasulullah, we are upon the truth. And they went out. It was the first time. Abdullah ibn Abbas was the first time that we went out in public as a group. Hamza was in front of us and so was Umar and Prophet in the middle. And he said, we marched towards the Kaaba itself. All the chiefs were standing there and not one of them dared to approach. They said, leave them alone. Any gathering that has Hamza and Umar heading them, no man with any brain will dare to approach. Leave them. And Abdullah Abbas says this is the first time that we prayed in a congregation without fear behind Umar and Hamza and the Prophet ﷺ leading us in front of the Kaaba. The glory of, yani, in terms of political strength, there was no one that could compete with Umar anhu being that. In, it was in his time that they reached China, subhanAllah. Abu Bakr Dilanu had a different role. Umar had a different role. Uthman had a different role. Ali had a different role. Each one was for a purpose that Allah saw fit for them to rule. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the conversion of Umar had a tremendous effect upon them. And after he had become a Muslim, the Muslims started to be a little bit more courageous in talking. But still the Quraysh, they doubled the stress and the persecution upon the Muslims after that. Yes, they were weary of Umar, but they doubled the stress and the persecution upon them. So, what did they do? They went to Abu Talib. Abu Talib. And they said to him, Listen, man, we've had enough. This is the last straw. If you do not hand over your nephew, and we'll give you blood money, hand him over so we can kill him or do whatever we want, or the entire of Quraysh is going to boycott you. They're going to boycott you and the entire Banu Hashim and Abdul Manaf. We're going to boycott the entire people who are related to Muhammad وسلم, from his father's side. No one's going to marry from you. No one's going to trade with you. No one's going to eat from your food. No one's going to socialize with you. You're going to be completely boycotted. This has never happened in the Arab world. And Abu Talib said to them, do whatever you want. Boycott everything. I will not stop protecting my nephew. Obviously, he's not protecting him because of deen. We said he's protecting him because of pride of lineage. And Abu Talib himself said, no, 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 actually I volunteer to leave. He took all of Banu Hashim and they left Mecca and they went outside and took a little valley which they called Shu'bat Abu Talib. The section of Abu Talib, till today they called it that way. And they sat, subhanAllah, being boycotted, my brothers and sisters, for the next two to three years. And in fact, Abu Jahl and the rest of the chiefs got together and they wrote a deal, a pact between them. In that deal they said, no one will deal interact, socialize, trade with, marry from, in any shape, way or form, with Banu Hashim and all the allies, anyone who supports Muhammad. 
All of them signed to it, they sealed it, and they wrote on top, Bismik Allahum, in your name, O Allah. Because they believed in Allah, but they made partners with Him. And they put it inside of the Kaaba, locked it up, and no one was allowed to go against it. For the next two to three years, the Muslims suffered the most suffering along with them were their cousins and relatives. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, ibn Abbas, sorry, because the slaves stayed in Mecca. It was only the families of the Prophet ﷺ. They said, we used to eat leaves and shrubs like the way goats and camels ate. And we used to survive on whatever water from the rain that came down to us. A lot of us, some of us attracted diseases, and some of us died from hunger. And Abdullah ibn Abbas says that when we went to relieve ourselves, to defecate, our defecation was like that of what you see in goats and sheep. Just little bits. We were sick for two to three years and we survived on food that someone had secretly brought to us. As time passed, there were groups of, of men that were related to the Prophet wasallam, or related to Abu Talib or related to them from their mother's side. One of them was Hakim ibn Hizam and uh, Mut'am ibn Adi. They were actually really, they were non-Muslims at the time, but they were good people. They were good people. And the Prophet ﷺ used to praise them. One of them was Mut'am ibn Adi. He never embraced Islam and he died before the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ said about this non-Muslim Mut'am ibn Adi, he said when the Battle of Badr happened, I just want to illustrate something important to you. When the Battle of Badr happened and he took those captives from the Battle of Badr as you know, and he said... Um, you know, anyone who can ransom them, I will release them. And anyone who can teach 10 Muslims how to read and write, I will also free them. The Prophet ﷺ made a statement that time, after the death of, of this non-Muslim Mut'am ibn Adi. He said, if Mut'am ibn Adi was still alive today, and he asked me to release all the prisoners and send them to Mecca for free, he said, Wallahi, I would have done so, just for him. And he is an enemy, he's a non-Muslim, he's on the side of Quraysh, uh, enemies. And what this teaches us, brothers and sisters, is... We should acknowledge people among the non-Muslims who support Muslims. There's nothing wrong with that. And work together with them on a common cause. There's nothing wrong with that. We've already spoken about this also in the third or fourth lecture which I gave when the Prophet ﷺ said, if I were to be called by the non-Muslims to this pact of, of helping the, the weak and, and the poor and so on and so forth, I would take part. I would take part with them. When we take part in things and you see us on television that they are helping the ambulances, they're helping the children's hospital, they're helping this cause or that cause. What's wrong with that? How's that going to serve against us? It's only in our favor, my brothers and sisters. And I may say something that may be controversial to some of you. I don't know if you're going to go against me. Allahu alam, but I'll say it. Maybe this is my opinion that I agree with some scholars about this. You know, to vote. To vote and to have a say in parliament. I know that it is upon democracy or whatever other than Allah, but we are living here and they've given us justice and peace to practice our deen. If you want to make a change, then seriously, wallahi, the only reality and practicality is to use the system that we live upon. Vote for things that benefit the Muslims. What's wrong with that? They have given you the opportunity to work through this system for the benefit of your own community. Why not use it? Why? Rasulullah sent the Muslims, 83 men and 18 women to Abyssinia. And what did he say to them? He said, go there, away from your family. And even I'm here and the Messenger of Allah is in Mecca. And he says to them, go there. Why? Because he said, listen to the words, my brothers and sisters. And Najashi, the Abyssinian king, he does not tolerate injustice and his people are good. Wallahi, he did not say anything other than that. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. He didn't say go there because Christianity is there. He didn't say go there because they rule by other than Allah. He knew they didn't rule by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system. He knew they weren't ruling by the Quran. Rasulullah is in Mecca. And he didn't tell them to stay because the Messenger of Allah is here. And if the Messenger of Allah was here and, and he lived in a place of persecution, he would tell you go to a safe place where you can practice your deen. He said to them, go only for one reason. He is just. He is fair. His system is justice. And they allow you to practice your deen. So they went to Abyssinia. And you know what's really strange, subhanAllah? In all the history books that I read and looked very hard, I could not find, subhanAllah, 
that the Muslims actually even gave da'wah. It's not there. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But it's not emphasized that they gave da'wah to the people of Ethiopia. The only one embraced Islam that we have is the Najashi himself. He embraced Islam in secret. Nor did they overthrow the government. Nor did, it, did they tell him, go and establish Sharia over there. No, no, no. And do you know how long they lived there for? More than 10 years. 13 years. Some of them died there. Even after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina. Some of them stayed there for a little while. And even after that, the Prophet ﷺ never said to them, overthrow the government. Why? Because the, the Najashi, the government of Ethiopia, they are the ones who gave them asylum. And they gave them justice. And they allowed them to worship in their own way. Islam is the only religion in our Sharia that gives the right to Christians and Jews and even non-Muslims of others, according to the majority of the scholars. They are allowed to their own municipality inside of the Sharia government, inside of an Islamic state, to have their own Christian courts, to rule by their own Christian Bible, by their own Torah, by their own system. And if there is a dispute between the Muslim and the non-Muslim, they go to the Muslim court. Maybe, Ikhwan, this is tolerance. Yani. This is the only way of harmony and surviving. And Muslims, yani, if I were to say to you that Islam came out to destroy and to not allow the kuffar to live among us, then I would say to you the Coptics of Egypt would have been the first. Their, their mere existence over there is evidence. They survived. They were there before Muhammad sallallahu Very old civilization, the Coptics, and they stayed there. And Islam spread and reached Egypt and gave them their rights. We don't do what they do. We're here for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought us a law and this is what we follow. There's nothing wrong with involving yourself in voting for the benefit of the Muslims and working with people that bring the benefit for the Muslims. As I told you, Wallahi, the Jews have a system where the court acknowledges they are allowed to rule by their Torah. Here in Australia, of divorces and marriage. They don't have to go to the marriage, to the family court at all. And the court acknowledges it. Why can't we do it? You know why? You have to be together. You have to have one word. But each person, Allahu Akbar. Hal haram to do this. It's kufr to vote. It's kufr to do this. Yeah, I mean, this is long gone now. And Alhamdulillah, I think we're starting to understand that, you know, there is a benefit for us in this. What benefit did we get in the past 20 years of saying it's kufr to vote? It's kufr to be part of that. What? We've only gone backwards. Wallahi, we would have had a say. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi accepted in Sulh al-Hudaybiyah. Remember the Hudaybiyah Treaty? We're going to come to that one day. He compromised. Many of the stuff that the Muslims had the right to. And the Sahabas went against him in that in some way. But he looked at the bigger benefit. They were allowed to give da'wah for, for 10 years. No war. He compromised a lot for, for the sake of da'wah. And really it worked in their benefit. So we have to use our wisdom, my brothers and sisters in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, being boycotted, he made dua against them that time. And Allah sent a famine. He said, oh Allah, bring upon them the famine like the famine of Yusuf alayhi salam. And that influenced a lot of the non-Muslims who had some sympathy for the Muslims to gather together and they said, let's go to the chiefs of Mecca and say to them, you know, that we disagree with this. So alhamdulillah, they went there and alhamdulillah, they broke this, this thing and the Muslims were released to come back into Mecca. And lastly, I say, the Prophet ﷺ said to his uncle Abu Talib, tell them to go and look at the treaty they made that is inside of the Kaaba. The worm or the uh, termite has eaten from it except for the word Bismik Allahum. They went inside and wallahi before their eyes, only that word was left. And that was one of the miracles that also affected a lot of them. My brothers and sisters, next week is the last lesson before Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from us. And inshallah, we will talk about the Isra' al-Ma'raj. Before the Hijrah. Jazakum Allah khair. Wassalamu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum. Wassalamu alaykum.